symposium series uh, dealing with stigma, mental health first aid to the rescue um, by Deborah Licht and Misty Hole from Pikes Peak Community College. Uh, just a few things before we get started. Um, we have muted everybody upon their entry into the WebEx just so that we're minimizing background noise, but we absolutely want to know what your questions and comments are. So over the course of the WebEx, if you have a question, you can um, click the little hand icon to raise your hand, or you can also just type a question into the chat uh, box there, and we'll be keeping track of all of your questions, and um, Misty and Deb will be answering them at the end of the session. And then also, um, this is going to be an interactive session in that we are going to have polls uh, throughout the session um, where Misty and Deb um, ask questions and get your feedback. Uh, so when the poll box comes up, it's very easy. You just um, uh, select your answer, you click Submit, and when the poll is done, the results are displayed right there in the box. Um, and then if you want to close the, the poll box, there's a little X at the top of that polling box there, and that is how you close it. And then I just want to uh, introduce uh, Deb and Misty to you, and then uh, they will get started. So uh, Deborah Licht is a professor of psychology and is the co-chair of the Department of Psychology at Pikes Peak Community College in Colorado Springs. She received her Bachelor of Science in Psychology from Wright State University, her master's degree in clinical psychology from the University of Dayton, and her PhD from Harvard University in experimental psychopathology in 2001. Deb has had over two decades of teaching and research experience in a variety of settings, ranging from a small private university in the Midwest to a large public university in Copenhagen, Denmark. She has taught introductory psychology, psychology of the workplace, abnormal psychology, the history of psychology, child development, and elementary statistics. Misty Hull is also a professor of psychology and the co-chair of the Department of Psychology at Pikes Peak Community College with Deb. She received her Bachelor of Science from Texas Tech and her Master's in Professional Counseling at Colorado Christian University in Lakewood, Colorado. She has taught a range of psychology courses at Pikes Peak, including introductory psychology, human sexuality, and social psychology. And she served in a variety of administrative roles at the college, including coordinator of the Student Crisis Counseling Office. In addition, she has helped to develop the state system's approach to teaching psychology as the state psychology discipline chair of the Colorado Community College System from 2002 to 2010. Misty and Deb were instru instrumental in bringing a mental health first aid program to Pikes, Peak, to Pikes Peak Community College. They explored the program and became certified in it initially because the college thought they might offer it as a one credit class for students. But the college decided instead to offer the class to administrators, faculty, and staff, and there was a resounding appreciation and interest in such training among faculty and staff. Misty and Deb's goal is to make the training useful in and relevant to the day-to-day -day jobs of the people in each training session, so with each one, they always tailor the examples for the unique audience in attendance, and they've been conducting these trainings at the campus for three years now. Um, so without further ado, Misty Hull and Deborah Licht. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, I'm, my name is Deborah Licht, and just to clarify, maybe on your screen you're seeing that Misty Hull is speaking, but that's because we're in the same room sharing the same computer. So, um, Misty, say hi so they know your voice. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here today. So, we, we do appreciate, um, Rachel, you um, letting us uh, present this today. We appreciate um, the attendees as well. Uh, we're, we know that this topic is of interest. Um, to you, and so we're hoping that we can provide some useful information. As I was thinking back on um, the last couple of years, trying to figure out, well, how did we how did we end up in uh, this mental health first aid kind of training situation? I thought about uh, something that happened about 15 years ago. I was sitting in on a job talk. Um, somebody was trying to, to get a job, and um, the man next to me raised his hand after about five minutes into the job talk and started asking the presenter a very rambling long question, which went on and on and on. And I sat there uh, wondering what was going on, thinking, well, maybe he was just really much, uh, much more into this topic and knew more. But then I started to realize that he probably was more likely uh, having a psychotic episode. And um, here we were, a room full of psychologists, a psychology graduate students, and nobody really knew what to do in that situation. Nobody, um, nobody tried to stop him. He rambled on. And I think one of the things that was, at least I knew for myself, was I was worried about what would happen if I did try to stop him. Would he 
react in some sort of violent, aggressive way. Um, and I also know there's part of it was the diffusion of responsibility that everybody thought somebody else was going to take care of the problem. Um, but imagine now what would happen if this were a room full of non-psychologists. How would they be responding to a similar scenario? Uh, people, lay people faced with these kinds of um, behaviors from someone in a psychotic state would react probably in a very similar way, not sure what to do, fearful of perhaps a violent reaction, um, and wondering what they can to do to help this person uh, at that particular point in time. And so that really brings us to the point of, of our presentation today, which is how do we help our colleagues, how do we help students, how do we help community members who are, who are facing these kinds of situations. We're going to start today, I'll be talking first about the link between mental illness and risk for violence. And then um, when I'm done with that, Misty's going to take over for a while and she'll be talking about how we can understand um, the behaviors that, that people, some people with mental disorders can lead to reactions of people surrounding them, stigmatization. And then we'll both be talking about how we've uh, used mental health first aid program in our college to, to help uh, increase um, literacy about mental illness. And then finally, we'll talk about how we can help to reduce stigma associated with mental illness. We will have time uh, at the end for your questions. So definitely, if you could type those into your chat boxes uh, at the end, we'll be able to address as many as we can. Uh, Misty and I have been working with our college on these is issues for many years. And Misty started uh, with some other um, faculty, a crisis counseling uh, center helping individual students who were having difficulties. We, we had uh, settings for our, um, the faculty administrators and staff, but our students didn't have a place to turn. Uh, so she helped develop that. And then we started to um, help from the other end with teaching our colleagues and students how to deal with people who are perhaps having some sort of mental health issue. Every time there's a tragedy, we have people coming to us, asking us our opinions about um, these different tragedies. And they, they come to us as professionals in the field. Uh, when the Aurora Theater shooting happened, which was very close to us, um, people asked us, was James, Holm, was James Holmes mentally disturbed? How could he have done this? How could he have killed 12 people if he wasn't? Uh, the Oak Creek, Wisconsin shooting, uh, why would Michael Page kill six people and wound four, four others unless he had some sort of mental disorder. Um, Sandy Hook Elementary School, the tragedy in Newtown. Uh, my, uh, Adam Lanza was, it was suggested, had Asperger's and perhaps autism. And again, uh, people come to us, they turn to us asking our professional opinion. And it's not just the shootings. In uh, early October in New York City, a man was slashing uh, passers-by on a bike path with scissors. He injured five people. And then in Washington, D.C., a woman was shot after she had tried to drive her car through a barrier at the White House. Um, and again, people are asking what, what they can do, how to understand this. We assume that you also are being confronted with these same issues. And so um, if you could pull up the poll box there, and if you could answer this question, have you been asked? Or have you talked about these uh, issues in the last year? We'll give you uh, time to answer those. So yes, it looks like a resounding 75% be able to see these results on your screen, you can see a resounding 75% have either been asked or have talked about mental illness uh, in the last year. And um, what we want to remind you that you can get rid of the poll box by clicking the X in the corner, as they pointed out earlier in the, in the uh, slideshow. So the question is often asked by, by our colleagues and um, communities, how, how can we stop this violence? Can we predict it? 
and um, can it be treated? These are the kinds of questions that, that psychologists are being asked. Um, in general, they're asking, is there a link between violent acts and mental disorders? That's the overall question that they're asking. And how do we answer this question? Uh, one way we, we try to answer it is we try to um, compare those with mental illness or mental disorders to those without and ask is there an increased likelihood that um, for violent acts. Also we can ask are there differences across disorders in terms of uh, potentially violent acts. Act. And you can um, think about well how do you answer these questions for your colleagues. These are really tough questions, they're complex, and there are no easy answers. Also for our students, students are not shy about telling us about their disorders. We have students come up to us with their accommodation forms and they disclose that they have traumatic brain injury or they have bipolar disorder. And um, it leads us often to think about um, what's going on in their lives and how will their disorders perhaps impact us, um, which, um, you know, what are our risks as instructors? This is a slide from um, a study by Norco and Baranowski, and this is just part of Table 1. They conducted an analysis of studies starting in 1990 through 2006, and they were looking for um, studies that found a link between mental illness and violence. And you can see a variety of studies here um, showing, in, indeed, there, there, um, there is um, a link that has been found. There's also this second table which shows the studies that didn't find a link between mental illness and violence. What they concluded was that the, one of the most important factors that we have to consider is substance abuse. That substance abuse alone and with mental illness um, is correlated with violent acts. They also found that uh, the socio-demographic factor, factors like gender, age, socioeconomic status, education, quote, they say, contribute significantly more than mental health factors to violence, end quote. So again, when we think about how to answer our colleagues' questions, we have to try to um, explain the complexities of substance abuse. We have to explain the complexities of sociodemographic factors and how these all contribute to increased likelihood of, of violence. There are inconsistent findings um, in relation between psychotic uh, episodes and other schiz and schizophrenic disorders between mental illness and violence. Um, and so um, we have to try to be able to explain why we're not able to find this clear and consistent link. This slide is um, from Swanson 2011. This is information looking at why, why do we have these conflicting findings and how can we explain this to the community. Uh, Swanson suggests that first we're dealing with the rare event problem. Most of the research that's done on violent acts is really done on things like fist fights, pushing, shoving, uh, all among family members, as opposed to the shooting episodes that we read about in the, in the newspaper. The shooting episodes are very rare in comparison to these other types of um, less violent acts. So there's not enough data on these rare events to make reliable predictions. The second issue is the population to individual problem. Uh, the data show a weak link between mental illness and violence in population, but we know that it's, we cannot go from a population risk to an individual's risk, that we are not able to say to, to a person, this is your risk based on the population risk. They also, uh, Swanson also discusses describing the inexplicable. He talked about a study that found one in 70,000 schizophrenia patient, patients per year commit a stranger homicide and provides descriptive data of those who did, including these were 95% male, average age was 32, 62% had never been hospitalized, 17% uh, were homeless. But we take this descriptive data and there's no way that we can make a prediction about an individual's uh, a, a risk factor for committing homicide. Again, from Swanson, quote, for every homicide perpetrator with schizophrenia who fits the profile of risk factors, there are tens of thousands of people with the same risk factors who will never commit a homicide. 
this is such a rare event, it's next to impossible to pick out um, who, who might be the next person who could do this. So we also have to remind ourselves that to describe something is not the same as predicting it. We can also look at the absolute risk for individuals. The great majority of those with mental disorders uh, in the community are not violent. We can talk about relative risk. Those with mental disorders are somewhat more at risk for violence than those without mental disorders. And then attributable, attributable risk. Violent acts are a part of a social problem, and this, the, thus violence is caused by issues other than mental illness, such as poverty and availability of guns. The Harvard Mental Health um, publication gives a nice summary of some of the risk factors associated with mental illness and violence. The question, though, that we should ask is, knowing these factors, how might they impact how people are reacted to? How might the knowledge of the, relation, uh, the relationship between uh, potential violence and a mental illness impact people's relationships, their work, their social activities, and so on? So what we're really asking is how do we um, understand people's reactions in terms of the stigma associated with mental illness? And I'm going to now turn over the mic to Misty. Hi, everybody. What I want you to do is take a quick look at this photo. And in the chat box, if you could just type in a few words that come to mind when you see this image. Who do you think lives here, for example? What would you say to your children about this house if this was a house on your block? Um, as, as a reminder, you could type your answers into the chat box. And if you do not see a chat box, if you hover over the top of your screen, it should pull down a toolbar, which will allow you to uh, chat. OK, great. I, I, we are getting in some, re, um, some responses, Misty and Deb. Um, I see schizophrenia, be careful around here, stay away, something to do with drugs, something to do with religion, avoid it. Absolutely. People have so, the paranoia. Yes, yeah, so all of these are really great examples of some of the initial reactions that we have to images like this. We're all at times guilty of making judgments, rather. Uh, right or wrong. And so what is stigma then? It's a sign or a branding mark. Um, here in our community, we have a small business owner who has many signs of someone who may be struggling with a severe mental illness. She struggles with disorganized thoughts, and she often jumps between unrelated topics. Um, many people avoid her business because they don't know how to interact with her. However, at one point in time, one individual had the courage to get to know her. And what they discovered was that this woman has brain cancer. As you can imagine, the community stepped up and they rallied around this woman, they support her business, and they do their best to support her. But what if we hadn't found out about her physical illness? What if the community continued to believe that she had a disabling mental illness? Would she still be in business today? People are judged more harshly if they have a mental illness than if they have a physical illness. Stigma is stronger with, mental, with a mental health diagnosis than with a physical health diagnosis. And many suggest that the stigma associated with mental illness is more distressing than the illness itself. It contributes to loneliness, to distress and discrimination, not only to the person with the mental illness, but also their families. Take just a moment, if you will, and I'm going to open the poll again, and I'd like for you to answer this question. Of the following disabilities, and given your choices, what do you think is the most disabling health issue in the United States? Okay. 
just a few more seconds here. All right, it looks like everybody's finished. You guys see the results? Here we go. All right, here's our results. And as you can see, the great majority answered um, with the correct answer as determined by McKenna and colleagues. It is unipolar major depression. And, uh, um, you know, this can be quite surprising to many people who, who don't understand the uh, severity of depression. In 2003, we found that people had the most negative views about drugs, addiction, alcoholism, and schizophrenia. And 16 to 19 year olds had the most negative and extreme attitudes. Although we found, the researchers, Chris et al, have found that those who stay in school, who have more education, they experience less negative attitudes. And we're gonna talk some more about education here in just a little bit. And you'll see here that people hold similar beliefs about those with schizophrenia as with those struggling with alcoholism and drug addiction, with the exception that those struggling with alcoholism and drug addictions are to blame for their condition. So what then is fueling these attitudes? Well, in part, it is the media. Uh, we only tend to focus on the negative aspects of mental illness, and we only read or hear about stories that relate to the visible minority. So think for a second about your own campus. How many times do you hear about the student with a mental illness really applying himself and really being successful at school? If you think about it, it probably isn't as often as we hear about those visible minorities, those who had an outburst in class, those who needed campus safety to intervene. As long as we only focus on the minority, we continue to promote stigma. We must be cautious of the words that we choose, slang words such as crazy, insane, lunatic. They only promote stigma. It's essentially the equivalent of calling someone fat or obese. The words are hurtful and they sting. And they continue to increase the distance between those who are different from ourselves. We know that employers are less likely to hire someone with a mental illness. Or landlords, they're less likely to rent a home to someone with a mental illness. As you can imagine, the individual self-image is impacted along with their self-confidence. So researchers are suggesting there's a three-pronged approach to reduce stigma. It first begins with education. We have to replace stereotypes with facts. Then meeting and interacting with mentally ill helps reduce prejudice. So having those one-on-one -on -one or one-to-one -one contact allows us to see that we can share in similar interests and cultivate friendships. Social activism and protest helps to highlight these injustices and chastise offenders for stereotypes and discrimination. Although I want to make a word of caution here, you have to be careful with social activism and protest because this can backfire and cause prejudice to remain unchanged or even worsen. Now researchers have found that education and contact help greatly. Contact is the better of the two when we're talking about adults. And face-to-face -face interaction is much better than video. Now what's interesting, however, is that adolescents actually prefer education. So what does this mean as we interact with adolescents? We have to be cautious about using peers as contacts, first of all. So that is high school students telling their stories about mental illness. So peer-to-peer -peer support may not be the best choice for adolescents, 
but research must still determine if this effect is true if the person interacting with the adolescent isn't close to their age. As we talk about education, one of the most effective things that we're finding is mental health literacy. This is the recognition of when a disorder may be developing, which is very difficult because often these disorders are happening or we're seeing them develop in adolescence. And so again, the young adolescent may not understand what's happening. This is also knowledge of help-seeking options and available treatments knowledge of effective self-help strategies for milder problems, and then the first aid skills to support those who are affected by mental health problems. We can use mental health literacy to reach not only adolescents, but children and adults alike. This is a knowledge about beliefs and mental disorders which aid in the recognition and management of mental illness. It is not simply knowledge for knowledge sake, but knowledge with the intent to make others' lives better. So again, we want to ask you another poll question here, approximately what percentage of people deal with a psychological disorder over the course of their lifetime? Okay, looks like everybody has responded. Okay, we got some close numbers here, but according to Kessler and colleagues, approximately 50% of people deal with a psychological disorder, and I want to emphasize over the course of their lifetime. So since we know that there is a, a large number of people dealing with uh, psychological disorders, one of the things that we have found, um, Deb and I, at our institution is the Mental Health First Aid Program. So Deb is going to talk to you just a little bit about what that is. Misty and I started um, talking about how we could help uh, in, a, in a broader way about three years ago, we were having discussions on our campus about uh, how to how to um, inform our colleagues, in particular faculty, about what to do when they were noticing problems. And uh, for example, online faculty would come to us with papers that were written or discussion board answers that were written and worried that what they were reading might be the sign of somebody who was either going um, thinking about suicide or perhaps maybe at risk for violence. So online as well as in person, it, our colleagues would come to us asking questions about what was going on in their classrooms and asking us if we could help them understand and predict and, and turn these students in the right direction for help if it seemed like that's what they needed. So we decided to look at this, the MHFA program, uh, which um, is really gives people tools to help someone experiencing a crisis until professional help arrives. It's a lot like a first aid training course in that um, we're not teaching people how to diagnose, we're not teaching people how to treat. All we're doing is giving them a way to identify perhaps things that are going on in someone else's um, life, their behaviors that indicate that they are in need of some sort of mental health support. This is, um, these are slides, by the way, that are provided by the Mental Health First Aid program itself. And so you can see this is an overview of the kinds of problems that, that get discussed in the course, uh, mood disorders, anxiety disorders. Uh, it's really similar to a brief abnormal psychology class that uh, we provide information about disorders 
uh, in a brief way, but also how to help individuals in a crisis situation or in a non-crisis situation, allowing people to recognize when something probably needs to be done. These are potential audiences that are using the mental health first aid training, hospitals, faith communities, law enforcement. When Misty and I first decided to get this training, we weren't sure how our academic colleagues would react to this. We were concerned that um, it might not be the right audience. But it's turned out that we have had overwhelming uh, positive reactions from uh, faculty, staff, administrators about how useful the information. And we've even been told that this is probably the most useful professional development um, program that they've been exposed to while at our college. So it has been very successful, we have found, with our academic colleagues. Briefly, the, the program was uh, originated in Australia in 2001, and it has expanded to 17 countries, uh, including everywhere from Scotland to South Africa to New Zealand. It was piloted in the United States in 2008, and it has been um, successful to a great degree. It's, uh, the Mental Health First Aid Program itself has had some very good um, publicity. There was an article recently printed, uh, published in the American Psychologist about the use of this program. The White House has, has pointed out that these kinds of training programs are an important uh, tool that we should be using across the United States. And Misty's going to continue on now. So there is continued ongoing research supporting the benefits of mental health literacy and the mental, first health, mental health first aid program in general. Uh, one of the major benefits that we see is the reduction of stigma. Um, that's such a huge piece in addition to um, increasing mental health literacy in general, helping others have a knowledge of what to do if they know somebody is in crisis, and then connecting the individuals to the much needed services. We've seen this on our own campus, and we are continually amazed at the responses of our colleagues. Uh, we hear on a routine basis how often our frontline office staff are using what they've learned in mental health first aid training. Uh, I want to give you one uh, example of what we've heard from one of our colleagues. Uh, for the sake of privacy, we'll call him Roger. Um, he found himself in a potentially dangerous situation. A student had come into his office angry at the financial aid office. Um, the student walked in and cornered Roger. Now, we have to explain to you that uh, um, at Pikes Peak Community College, not every office has uh, windows and access, multiple accesses out of the, the office. So Rogers is one of those offices where he has no windows and he has only one exit. And he told us, he began to think back to the training about what he should do and say to this angry student. And Roger told us that one of the first things that came to his mind was to get into a public place and out of the confined office where the student was blocking the exit. Roger said that the first thing that he did was he said, I can see you're upset. And while standing up, he began to move to the door and he said to the student, walk with me. Let's go get a cup of coffee and see how we can help you. He said that while he still felt nervous and anxious, he did feel more confident in how to handle this potential situation. One of the other uh, incidents that we, we heard about was with one of our uh, career advisors. And we had been offering a training on mental health literacy and mental health first aid. And in that particular four-hour training that day, we covered um, just how to deal with anxiety and panic. And um, that evening, this young woman was working late at the college. She had some work to finish since she was in training that day. And um, the campus went on lockdown. And uh, so she began to follow procedures. She got under her desk, turned off the lights in her office, locked the doors, not necessarily in that order. But anyway, she ended up underneath her desk with the lights off. And she said as she sat there, she could hear people coming by and jiggling the doorknob to her office. And she said she began to panic. And she began to get nervous. And she began to 
become anxious because she didn't know if the person jiggling the doorknob was the person who was loose on campus uh, or if it was the campus safety and the police department working to ensure her safety. And she told us that as she came to the training the next day, she said that she continued to hear our voices talking about ways to help if somebody is experiencing panic or anxiety. And she said she began to think about, okay, breathe. And she began to talk to herself and while reciting many of the things that she had learned in training. So we are excited that um, our colleagues are finding this kind of, of training not only useful to work with other people, but they're finding it personally beneficial as well. As of 2011, over 45,000 people in the United States have been trained in mental health first aid, and over 1,800 people have been certified to teach mental health first aid. All of the instructors obtain certification to conduct the eight-hour program by completing a five-day instructor certification training. That's correct, it's five days long. Um, most often, instructors will be staff from behavioral health providers, um, local or state mental health authorities, um, maybe even some mental health uh, advocacy organizations. And in some cases, um, organizations may tap into partner organizations or identify volunteer leaders to conduct the programs. In all cases, however, instructors must meet general criteria and knowledge of mental health and addiction and possess the ability to communicate and transfer knowledge effectively. The goal of Mental Health First Aid is that by 2020, Mental Health First Aid in the United States will be as common as First Aid and CPR. So to become a certified Mental Health First Aider, you participate in an eight-hour training program. And during the training, the participants are given a manual that covers all the topics to be discussed during the training and much more. The manual is a reference that participants take with them as they complete the training. And instructors are provided with activities, PowerPoints, and videos that help structure the eight hours. Everyone comes into the training thinking, wow, eight hours is a lot of my time to be away from the office. But without fail, one of the things that Deb and I are hearing is that uh, participants are writing, I should say, on their evaluations at the end of training that they wish they had more time to continue to learn. So if you're interested in learning more about mental health first aid in general, these are a couple of websites um, and uh, uh, email addresses or a phone number that you can call to receive more information. And I'm sure this will be available after the presentation as well. So what can we do? First of all, we have to work to change our conversations. You know, at one point, there was a language shift in our discipline from working with a person to working with cases. Um, as we educate those in our classrooms, we have to remind them that we work with people. Thinking, feeling, people. We can be mental health literacy advocates, and we should be modeling people-first language and avoid using slang in our classrooms that dehumanize and stigmatize others. And we should be aware of the resources on our campus and in our communities. So let me ask another question. Again, I'm just going to open the poll. And I'd like for you just to respond, are there efforts on your campus to reduce stigma associated with mental illness? And perhaps I should have listed an I don't know response, but we'll go with these for now. All right, let's look at our results. So there's about 42% of you that do have efforts uh, on your campus. Now, using the raise your hand button on the, the box there, I want you, for those of you who said yes, there are um, resources uh, on your, or uh, efforts on your campus to reduce stigma, how many of you can effectively communicate what those resources are to your students? 
Can you just raise your hand if, if you can effectively communicate these? Andrea, what are we seeing? I am seeing, I'm go, kind of going through the participants, I see about five hands are raised right now. Right, and so this is one of the things that we found at our campus as well, is that, um, you know, we know that there are efforts going on, we know that there are things that are being done on our campuses to reduce stigma, but many of us don't know how to explain those effectively to our students. And so this is another goal um, of our mental health literacy and mental health first aid training. Um, we are continually hearing from many of our colleagues um, that they know that we have resources, but they don't know what those resources do. So as part of our training, we provide a list of community and campus resources and what they can do um, to help, and they get these resources um, before they leave the training. Can I just, I'd like to add, this is Deb again, that this has become an important part of our institutional goals as well. It's a part of our strategic plan to make sure this information is available. So at Pike State Community College, we have what we call our uh, SURF team. It's our Student Urgent Response Force. It's not really a, a great title, but it's a very efficient one when the email subject line reads SURFs up. Everyone knows that's a part of this team to stop what they're doing and to make time to meet about an urgent need or situation. So as Deb mentioned, um, we've really plugged into mental health literacy on our campus, and as she said, our college president and vice president, they support um, mental health literacy education and have, again, tied our trainings into a strategic plan in order to continue efforts on our campus to reduce stigma and to empower our community. So this is something that, at least on our campus, that is really catching, uh, uh, getting good wind in their cells, so to speak, to really move forward and to help decrease stigma uh, associated with mental illness around our campus. So we're coming to the end of our uh, presentation here, and uh, we wanted to just think about what kind of conclusions that we can draw, uh, what can you now say to your colleagues and students about the link between mental illness and violence? I think uh, my, my feeling is that um, I, what I'll answer when they ask me these questions is that it, the link really depends on the type of mental illness, the type of violence we're talking about, but in particular that substance abuse is a very important factor. So if we need to talk about efforts to um, reduce violence, and we really should be talking about uh, substance abuse as an important, an important thing to look at. The second question, what's the role of an individual psychology instructor in reducing uh, the stigma of mental illness? Again, thinking about my own classroom, uh, my colleagues' classrooms, office hours, to really begin to educate people about using people-first language uh, as opposed to talking about an illness and um, to be thinking about different kinds of assignments we can use to uh, educate people about the stigma associated with mental illness. And then finally, uh, the last question, how can you increase mental health, mental health literacy on your campus and in your community? We have just been so pleased with the use of mental health first aid training. The eight-hour training is, uh, is quite, um, quite long and hard for many people to to get to. So we've also provided shorter training sessions. We've provided, we have high school students uh, at, on our campus, and so we've provided a shorter training to our high school uh, instructors who are on our campuses as well, and they have found that to be very useful uh, for them. And then just, um, we, we just want to close by uh, showing you, this is a response by Michael Fitzpatrick from NAMI, and this was, uh, he wrote a um, a uh, letter after the, the Navy Yard shooting, and we think this is a really um, a nice way to, um, to end this program about dealing with stigma. Okay, Andrea, so we'll turn it back to you and um, address any questions that you may have. If yes, we can. everybody, as a <laughs> reminder, uh, please do type the questions into the chat box. Um, 
If you do not see a chat box, just hover over the top of your screen. That will bring uh, down a, a toolbar where you can select uh, chat, which will bring the message, uh, the chat box. And we have a few questions uh, already. The first question that we have for, uh, for you is, what is the best way to ensure continuity of care for students who are not comfortable with receiving services on campus? Well, I, I think one of the things that we provide at, for the people who participate in these programs is we do provide them with a list of different services. Uh, so first, we, we would um, recommend that students visit our, we have a crisis resource counseling center, and we would definitely recommend that students visit there if they can. But if not, we do have lists of programs in the community that we hope are helpful uh, in in that kind of continuity of care, right. and One of the things that we, we did at Pikes Peak Community College was we worked with our foundation to, um, to, to see if we could provide uh, just a little bit of, of money for those people who may need to obtain some mental health um, counseling. And so after they have visited our student counseling office, uh, we don't provide ongoing therapy there, but we will work with them to help place them with a community therapist. And, and our foundation and our student government have worked together to set aside a few funds to help pay for two or three sessions uh, of, of counseling with one of our community mental health partners. And so this has been something that has really helped just allow students, one, to, to become more comfortable visiting our campus resources and to let them know that not only um, do we care about them, but we want to help them get those services um, by helping pay for it initially until they can uh, work with the community therapist to figure out a way to, um, to pay for it themselves after, like I said, I believe it's two to three sessions. And so that's one of the first things is, is think outside of the box. Um, who on your campus, for example, our foundation, our student government, we really wanted them to be a part of this program to help reduce stigma. And uh, um, they were willing to work together to even provide some dollars to do so. Thank you so much. Um, the next question I have is how do you help students understand the need for assistance isn't a weakness? That's a great question. I think that uh, it's gonna vary by by student, but I think one of the first things that we do is we come together as a community to promote mental health literacy. And um, when people begin to talk about um, the people first and we do things to reduce stigma, then it's not as much of a struggle, at least that's what we're finding on our campus, that it's not as big of a struggle to get people um, to see it as a positive. Um, we also try to relate it to physical health issues. If you were a struggling diabetic, you need those, that insulin to, to keep you healthy. And so there are many things that, that you wouldn't compromise as a diabetic in order to survive. And so we, we try to, to frame things in a way that allows the students to understand that um, would you recognize somebody with diabetes as being weak if they walked away from their insulin? And so just using language and, and practical examples to help students plug into the fact that, that uh, um, it's not about weakness, but it's about strength and, and getting the resources that you need to be successful. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we have so many questions coming in. There's a lot of interest. Uh, mental health specialists at time, times feel as though they are dropping the ball in terms of their role in reducing the stigma associated with mental illness. What is the number one change that they must follow through with to help reduce stigma? Well, again, I think it goes back to um, changing our language. You know, I think one of the, the things that we said earlier about, you know, we, we work with people and uh, uh, we don't work on cases. Um, yes, you may have a case load, but to remind students that w these are people, they're individuals that need support and, uh, um, and help, and, and we can't just assume that 
because they're different from us that uh, um, that they don't think and feel. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, next question is, at which age do you start teaching about mental health first aid? Well, I would say I don't know that we would teach the mental health first aid necessarily, but we certainly start teaching about mental health literacy very early, as early as the first questions that maybe children have about seeing somebody who is uh, maybe in a psychotic state or trying to understand somebody who's depressed. The actual program itself, I think they are developing, if I'm right, Misty, they're developing for high school level students as well at this point. Right. So I don't think they're going to go much younger than high school, but um, that's, that program is still in development. Okay, thank you. Uh, and our next question from our chat panel is, post-secondary students are in the middle of the process of identity development and are also at the age at which many mental disorders first emerge. What are your thoughts on the convergence of these two issues in relation to stigma and help seeking? That's a, that's a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think it's, it's critical that, again, that we make sure that as we are raising children in, in, in our own families or in schools, that, that if we can continue to talk about um, not being judgmental of other people's um, symptoms or disorders, then if, if an adolescent him or herself starts to develop a disorder, uh, perhaps then there'll be um, less of an impact on their identity. And we also, uh, you know, want to talk about making sure that when, when these individuals are talking about what's going on, that if they're talking about, oh, I'm just stressed or I'm just feeling low, that, that we recognize they may be trying to normalize a behavior that um, might need more support. And so because adolescents are, don't always know what's happening, um, it, it takes a village, so to speak, to really be aware of what you're seeing in, the, in those uh, individuals and maybe ask more directed questions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next question from the chat panel is, can you tell us a story about uh, a first aid intervention? Oh, we have many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Our attendees would love to hear them. Yes. Which one do you want to tell? Oh, Deb, let's tell the one about uh, um, the on the street. Oh, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. You can tell that one. Well, Deb and I were working at uh, uh, the college one Sunday afternoon, just trying to finish up some chair work, and uh, we decided to leave our downtown campus. And as we drove off, we turned the corner, and we see a couple of women standing on the sidewalk, and we had our windows down, and we hear one of them say, help. They were sitting, by the way. They one was standing, standing, one was sitting. Okay. Yes, help, help. And so as, as we looked over, Deb uh, was, was sitting in the passenger seat, and she looked over, and she sees one woman laying on the, the sidewalk and another woman saying, help. And we, uh, um, Deb jumps out of the car <laughs> and um, races over to this individual. I turn the corner and park the car as I begin to call 911. And uh, we began to just use our, our um, mental health first aid tools. We began to assess our situation to figure out what was happening. Um, Deb started working with a woman who could clearly talk and was asking for help. The other woman was on the ground, um, pretty much unconscious. Um, I began to work with her while I'm on the phone with uh, uh, 911. As a result, what we learned was that uh, the women were incredibly intoxicated and um, just could not um, communicate very effectively because of the, the level of, of intoxication. And I, I, just to add that the mental health first aid training program that we teach includes a, a portion on how to deal with someone who's inebriated. And so Misty was able to follow the steps that we've been teaching about um, to get to make sure this woman didn't um, didn't vomit, uh, didn't asphyxiate, and so forth, and so it was very very useful to have that very fresh in our minds. 
But I want Deb to also tell about your student that uh, came to your class. Oh, so I, I had a student who um, ar arrived early to a class, and he was sitting outside the classroom, uh, and I was convinced he was drunk. I mean, he was just absolutely out of it. And I walked into the classroom, leaving him in the hallway, being a little bit perturbed at him. And then I started to rethink, um, using my mental health first aid skills, that maybe there was something else going on. So I went back out into the hallway and started to talk to him about what was going on. And it turned out he was having uh, an insulin reaction and he uh, needed medical help. And I think that was a very good lesson for me and for every everyone that I've talked to since then, which is that we should not judge immediately that someone is high or uh, is drunk because there are many medical um, types of uh, issues that, that might mimic that kind of behavior, and he did get safely to the hospital. So did our, our women who were on the, the street as well. The paramedics came, and that's the one point that we want to make is, uh, as mental health first aid teaches, as soon as medical help arrives or somebody more important than you, you move out of the way. Your work is done, and uh, uh, they take over. And so that's the, the real beauty of, of this particular program is that it, it really works with um, you to understand that you're only there to intervene in a crisis until professional help actually does arrive. Thank you. Those were great stories. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Um, the last question I have comes from a, an instructor who teaches lifespan human development, uh, and the content is something that many of the students respond to. So what is the approach or idea uh, when a student initially raises a question or concern? Well, I think it starts at the very beginning of your semester. Um, one of the first things that Deb and I really emphasize in our classrooms is um, we won't be using any sort of stigmatizing language in our rooms. And so as a result, um, you know, we, we set the expectation right away for um, what, what will occur in the classroom. And then as we learn about uh, if students come and share with us either privately after we've covered a particular topic. Um, one of the next questions that we often ask is, you know, is, if it's appropriate, obviously, is this something that you want others to know? Um, or is this something that you're just telling us um, because we need to be aware of what kind of supports that we can provide for you as well? So it's, it's kind of a... Um, an expectation setting at the beginning as well as really pulling that individual in to, to find out from them what it is that they need. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Misty. Thank you, Deb, uh, for this wonderful presentation. I have a few more things um, before hanging up the line. First of all, I want to let you know that we are now approved by the American Psychological Association to sponsor continuing education for psychologists. So we're now able to actually uh, provide CE credits for this, uh, for this webinar. Uh, Misty and Deb are both authors at Worth Publishers. They're publishing Scientific American Psychology this January. There is no obvious conflict of interest in today's presentation. And for more information about the continuing education credits, please email me at uh, amacinio at worthpub.com. I will be emailing you as well, so you don't have to write down this uh, ridiculously long last name that I have. Um, you could simply respond to me, and I'll send you the questionnaire that you have to fill out. We will be uh, posting the recording to Faculty Lounge. If you log into Faculty Lounge or register, you will then be able to log in and go to the TLC tab where you can see the recording of this presentation, as well as past presentations that we have uh, that we have recorded. So, thank you again, uh, Misty and Deb. Thank you to all of our attendees who made this a great session. Um, and thank you, Andrea. Deb and I would also just like to express our thanks for everybody participating in your questions, and and we just appreciate the time that you've given us today as well. Okay. Bye.